And being in the oldest Catholic university in the United States, and being myself a Catholic, it is so decided. This was the moment when Antonio Guterres became the next head of the UN. What's known as a vote by acclamation, applause showing the General Assembly backed last week's secret ballot in the Security Council. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Senhor Presidente da República Portuguesa, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a solemn moment. I find myself experiencing a whirlwind of emotions and thoughts. I am deeply honored and grateful for the trust you have placed in me to serve as the Secretary General of the United Nations for a second term. Serving the United Nations is an immense privilege and the most noble duty. In this affectionate way, the Pope and Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, greeted each other. They spoke privately in Spanish for a few minutes. Guterres traveled to Rome to discuss with Pope Francis issues like the environmental crisis, poverty and inequality, multilateralism, the protection of refugees and migrants, human trafficking, wars and nuclear disarmament. After came an exchange of gifts. Pope Francis gave the UN Secretary General an engraving, which he politely showed reporters. The Pope also gave him a copy of his message of peace for the year 2020, as well as the Abu Dhabi document on human fraternity, which Guterres really appreciated. It was a very cordial encounter, showing the great connection between the two leaders. Before his work at UNHCR, Mr. Guterres spent more than 20 years in government and public service. He was Prime Minister of Portugal from 1995 to 2002. Georgetown University is thus proud to bestow upon the Secretary General Antonio Guterres the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Congress of the United States and by the Board of Directors of Georgetown University, I officially confer upon Secretary General Antonio Guterres the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. It's now my pleasure to present Dr. Antonio Guterres, who will offer the commencement address. Dear President, dear graduates, dear friends, all protocol observed, I am extremely grateful for this uh, undeserved honor and for the extremely kind words that uh, uh, you have expressed about myself. But I'm particularly happy and honored to be part of the commencement ceremony of uh, the Walsh School of Foreign Service of Georgetown University. I must confess that I feel particularly at home here. I've been in Georgetown several times, and I cannot forget that more than 1,000 of my colleagues were students in Georgetown, 1,000 of UN staff around the world. <laughs> These, not to mention that four of the UN ambassadors in the United Nations were or are still linked to Georgetown, and namely my very good friend, Madeleine Albright. And so I feel at home. And so I feel at home. But even more at home, because this is a school of foreign service. 
if my research is uh, correct, when uh, this school was founded uh, after the First World War with the objective of uh, forming uh, leaders in global trade and commerce, uh, and a school like this could have many names, School of Trade, School of International Relations, School of International Studies, but as far as I was told, Father Edmund Walsh wanted it to be called Student School of Foreign Service, because the word service would be much more in line with the values of Georgetown University. Sisters and brothers, most especially descendants who have traveled so far to be with us. Today, the Society of Jesus, who helped to establish Georgetown University and whose leaders enslaved and mercilessly sold your ancestors stands before you to say that we have greatly sinned in our thoughts and in our words, in what we have done, and in what we have failed to do. We pray with you today because we have greatly sinned and because we are profoundly sorry. It is our very enslavement of another, our very ownership of another, culminating in the tragic sale of 272 women, men, and children that remains with us to this day, trapping us in an historic truth for which we implore mercy and justice, hope and healing. We do not seek to move on with this apology, but to move forward with open hearts to respond to the urgent demands of justice still present in our time. The expression of contrition that we offer today guides, permeates, animates our ongoing work for justice. We build a more just world with honest reflection on our past and a commitment to a faith that does justice. The Jesuit may be individually honest unless the interest of his order obliges him to be otherwise. For there are no considerations of religion, honesty or virtue which he does not feel himself bound peremptorily and at all times to sacrifice to this one supreme consideration. The end sanctifies the means, is his favorite maxim, and as his only end, as we have shown, is the order. At its bidding, the Jesuit is ready to commit any crime whatsoever. And this is something that makes me feel very proud to be here with you today. You have the chance to have studied in Georgetown. And very few people around the world have the chance to study in a university of this quality. So we are all tremendously privileged. And being in the oldest Catholic university in the United States, and being myself a Catholic,
varying fortunes and making slower progress as time went on, the Jesuit order at last reached the pinnacle of its power and prestige in the early 18th century. It had become more influential and more wealthy than any other organization in the world. It held a position in world affairs that no oath-bound group of men has ever held before or since. The Jesuits were masters of the courts of almost all the Catholic kings and sovereigns, wrote St. Simon in his memoirs, and Father Cordara, Society of Jesus, admitted that nearly all the kings and sovereigns of Europe had only Jesuits as directors of their consciences, so that the whole of Europe appeared to be governed by Jesuits only.
town in central Portugal, just over an hour's drive from Lisbon. Tumar is one of Portugal's best kept secrets, an historic town whose castle served as the headquarters of the famous Knights Templar for hundreds of years. The town is dominated by the magnificent Convent of Christ. The castle of the Knights Templar dates from 1160 and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Tumar and its surrounding region is awash in history, charm, and beautiful architecture. Almost everywhere you visit in the town, elements that refer to the Templar Knights are there for you to discover. And being in the oldest Catholic university in the United States, and being myself a Catholic,
Romanism is not a religion merely, but a political system. The constitution of the Church of Rome may be considered the most formidable combination that was ever formed against the authority and security of civil government, as well as against the liberty, reason, and happiness of mankind. Peace and prosperity are impossible under papal and priestly rule, as all history attests. The papacy, says Prince Bismarck, has ever been a political power which, with the greatest audacity and with the most momentous consequences, has interfered in the affairs of this world. Estimados amigos y amigas, el próximo martes 9 de julio dará comienzo en Nueva York el Foro Político de Alto Nivel sobre Desarrollo Sostenible. Es el mejor mecanismo creado por Naciones Unidas para dar seguimiento y evaluar los avances en el cumplimiento de los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible. Recordamos cómo en el año 2015 la comunidad internacional suscribió los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible que junto con el Acuerdo de Financiación y el Acuerdo de París de Lucha contra el Cambio Climático forman la Agenda 2030. Esta es la hoja de ruta que debería cumplir la comunidad internacional para alcanzar el desarrollo sostenible en todos los países del mundo para dicha fecha.
I do not like the reappearance of the Jesuits, wrote ex-president John Adams as early as 1816 to his successor, Thomas Jefferson. Shall we not have regular swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as printers, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is the society of Loyola's. Nevertheless, we are compelled by our system of religious toleration to offer them an asylum. Jefferson replied to his predecessor, Like you, I disapprove of the restoration of the Jesuits, for it means a step backwards from light into darkness.